Hi, I'm Must Reader, and this is my video podcast on rationality, transhumanism, productivity, and trends in, of development in society. Today, here with me is Eugen Akulic, a principal at Boston Consulting Group, Geneva office, and an executive coach. Hi, Eugen. Hey, 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 Must Reader. How are you? Uh, great, thank you for joining in. Uh, this is the first uh, video podcast that I'm doing remotely, so these times require uh, extraordinary actions and methods, but I hope that all our viewers will enjoy good quality of picture. I'm pretty sure this is the new normal, so we all have to learn the skills. Absolutely. Uh, let's uh, start from uh, the question that's been nagging me for a long time. I know that you are uh, an extraordinary consultant. Uh, you uh, are very young for being a principal. You have achieved uh, much success in uh, management consulting. Uh, and uh, for some reason, you enrolled in the coaching industry. Uh, how did it come to be? It's, it's a long story. To make it short, I think that every manager should be a coach. And actually, when you work in consulting, they give you a little bit of coaching training once you become a manager. So, meaning that coaching is recognized as one of the best techniques how to engage with people, how to manage your team, how to engage with clients, etc. But I felt that was not enough. That was very basic what they gave us at the training. I mean, like you have just two hours of theory, a little bit of practice, go do it. And then um, at one point I was given a coach myself. Uh, I think for some kind of achievements as a top trainer in Europe or something like this, they, they give you like a little thank you. So on the list of things that they offered, I saw, okay, I can select a great coach. So and I, I, I used to work with coaches before, like I think I had probably four or five coaches before, and those sessions were helpful, I would say, right? So they helped me realize my limitations, my roadblocks, what I can do better. But that session with that coach was transformational. So we had just two hours. That was, I think, uh, Dusseldorf Airport. I was about to board a 28-hour flight to Sydney. And... Uh, we had two hours from 9 to 11. And you know what? That meeting was transformational to me. I mean, I got on the plane and I couldn't stop crying for almost three, four hours. Really? Yeah. And those there were the tears of relief. I, feel, I felt really relieved. I don't know. I haven't felt so relieved in a very long time. And I... I don't know, my productivity jumped like fivefold. I managed to do in five hours whatever I planned for the whole flight of 20 hours, you know. And uh, when I landed, I thought, wow, that was really powerful. And then there was another coincidence, like a couple of months later, one of my colleagues um, told me about her experience of going to the school of becoming a coach with this coach that I had the session with. So I reached out to that coach and she said, yes, absolutely. I wanted to invite you yourself if you're interested. And I said, like, great. So uh, I paid for education and that was a really great experience. Of, uh, I think we had nine months of education and um, then we started practicing right away. And uh, yeah, since a year and a half, I'm executive coach. What exactly, uh, if it's not a top secret, uh, have you discussed with uh, this uh, with this coach uh, who made you cry because uh, as far as i know you're not a very sentimental kind of guy what made you uh, what hit you so profoundly um you know as it usually happens in such sessions and it happened to some of my clients as well uh who also cried in our first session was uh, you come with a very basic situational request to the coach I think for me, there was something to do how I should get more space in the meetings in front of the client because my boss was a little bit, um, how do I say, taking all the space. Yeah, so like if he's in the meeting, like there's little chance you can speak. And uh, I came with that issue and it's like, what can I do there? And somewhere in the middle of it, we started talking about really fundamental underlying issues. 
that was behind this request. And she asked me to do one interesting exercise after which I realized, fuck, I'm so tired, I'm exhausted. I have <laughs> pushed myself over the limit and I have to allow myself to slow down. I've achieved a lot, I don't have to kill myself because I'm very close to collapsing. And just realization and allowing myself, saying it to myself that, hey, Eugene, you're allowed to slow down, just made me cry when I boarded the plane. It didn't hit me right away, but then for two hours, I couldn't stop crying. And uh, that was so powerful. It's just, it's just, I never thought I'm gonna end up there, you know, talking about how tired I am and like that I'm so tired because I don't allow myself to, to have a rest. You know, when I came with that issue of just uh, how can I get more space in the board meetings? I don't remember the whole logic of how we got there, but <laughs> that was really what was most important. Yeah. Uh, from what you're describing, this uh, looks like uh, a session with a, a psych psychother psychotherapist. Uh, well, how does it differ? Yeah, it's, it's a very good question. I think um, in terms of professional help, you can look at a couple of, I would say there are four roles that, or like four professionals that can help you. That could be a consultant, that could be a mentor, that could be a coach, and that could be a therapist. I think that for you to understand where the coach is different from the rest, I need to give a little bit of description of what the others do. So a consultant okay. is the person who comes, looks at your data, at your situation, and gives you an advice based on some analysis, etc. Yeah. So a career consultant would, for example, be able to look at the market and tell you, look, you know, here and here and here, you have the best opportunities, best salaries, blah, blah, blah. You have these strengths, like just go there. Mentor is someone who is probably a couple levels more experienced than you, usually familiar with the environment you're in. So if, if you're in consulting, so take a mentor from consulting who's not your direct boss, who's been through the steps you are going through now, who knows how things work up there, who can give you an advice. So consultant and mentor give you advice and recommendation. Consultant based on the data and the market research, whatever. Mentor based on his or her knowledge of how things work. Now, therapist, on the other hand, is usually a specialist in psychiatry or psychology. They look at you, they analyze you, they apply different kind of uh, techniques and methods, and they also give you advice. Sometimes they prescribe you meds, right? But they work not with the situation, your work, etc. They work on this psychological level right away. Now the coach is somewhere in between. So what the coach doesn't do, the coach doesn't give you advice. Good coach never gives you advice. Hmm. Uh, if, if you have a coach who gives you advice, that's not a good one. <laughs> yeah. Um, the thing is that the, the whole idea behind coaching is that the person knows the answer. He or she just have to find this answer somewhere, you know, in, in, inside them. On the other hand, they work on both levels. On coaches work on the situation level with your business challenges, your work, your office, whatever, and at the psychological level with your fundamental beliefs, your challenges, kind of etc. What coaches don't work with is psychological trauma. That's where psychiatrists work. The therapists will help you heal your childhood trauma. And I have some clients through the work uh, through coaching, we kind of get to the point when we understand, okay, the root cause of the behavior of this person lies in some psychological trauma. And sometimes that becomes very clear what the trauma is. I can give you one example. I had a, a coachee, one of my first, and like first four sessions, we could not get below this, you know, situational level, like what's happening at her work. And they were just getting a little bit into some psychological level, you know, the, the level of what, what her emotions. And uh, in all four sessions, I could see that there is a pattern, the same thing happening, but we couldn't get to the bottom of it. She was not letting me go deeper. And then probably one, two months later, we had this, uh, just, we had beers in the bar. And she was telling a story about how she couldn't say goodbye to her father. Uh, because like she saw him in hospital, he had some oncological problems and then 
basically she got on the train and it's like eight hours to get where she lived from from where her father was and he passed away during that time when she was in the train and like she was hesitating actually whether she should go home or like stay with him etc and the thing is that she realized and she told me oh my gosh i now understand you know what happened is like i cannot forgive myself for uh like you no know, not seeing last minutes of my father's life and I, she was trying to punish herself by making the wrong choices at work by choosing the situations and working with the assholes like she was taking this as a self-punishment for something that she blamed herself for i mean that came out throughout discussions but i'm not a psychiatrist i'm not a therapist i told her look i cannot help you with this you have to go to a specialist and deal with that yeah Quite often you see that root causes lie in like your relations with your parents, with your family at school, etc. I say, I stop there. I say, look, this is something where I'm not the best to help you. You have to go to the therapist. And good coaches have some contact numbers on their phone, speed dial <laughs> to give you one. Yeah. So that, that's the difference, I think. And um, uh, so basically coaching to sum it up, sorry for a long answer, right? It's something that helps you understand your self better what's going on the situation level what drives us on psychological level without going into trauma and going back to the situational level and and finding the answer uh well uh who needs a coach then uh i understand who needs a psychiatrist or a therapist uh, but who is uh, the target audience of such kind of services i would say anyone I mean, the same as the, with a mentor or therapist. With a consultant, I would say there are very few specific cases where you need a consultant. With a mentor, I would recommend everyone to get a mentor. With a therapist, I think every person after 25 should have <laughs> yeah, one. Um, the same is with a coach. You should have one if you are a bit older than 20. <laughs> right? The thing is that with coaching, probably most value will come if you're a bit older. Because you have more answers in your uh, in yourself, and that's where mentors will not necessarily help you. Because if you're above thirty, or I mean, this is just a kind of arbitrary line, but you have enough experience to be very critical about any piece of advice that other people other people give you, even if they are like super cool mentors. Like if you get, I don't know, Bill Gates as a mentor. Yes, you listen to him, but you will not follow what he tells you. You will say, "Ha, hey, yeah, smart idea, but I will do something different." Right? That's why coaching plays a very different role, because in coaching, you find answers yourself. And then if you say, I'm going to do something, then there's a high likelihood that, gonna do some, that you're going to do something. You know? So I think everyone that's like any person should, should get a coach. The, the, the better question is like, what kind of problems you can come to a coach? And I think that 80% of problems that people come with mm -hmm. are related to their work challenges, like in the work environment, uh, sometimes in their family. Uh, sometimes relations with husbands, wives, uh, sometimes uh, just um, general, I don't know, things like procrastination or um, uh, effectiveness or sports or whatever. Yeah, Quite often, these are the situations where people know what to do, more or less, or they think they know what to do. But they say, I, I, I just cannot start doing this. I don't know why. I know what, that I have to be doing this, but I just don't do this. Uh, how do you solve those problems? You already mentioned that uh, you do not give advice as a, as a coach. As a, as a consultant, you give advice. As a coach, you, you don't. Yeah. Uh, you try to find uh, the answers inside uh, uh, those uh, people's uh, minds uh, how does it work so you basically as a coach you have some instruments in your pocket right the the most powerful ones are questions and observations so and i like this analogy sometimes a coach is like your mother imagine you have your glasses on you and you're looking where are the glasses like but they're on your on your nose right and you just don't see them and your mom says hello it's here so that's observation, right? <laughs> it's basically uh, kind of showing to you something that is so obvious, so in front of you, but you just don't notice it, yeah? So by just observing you, yeah. the coach can, can say something, hey, you know what I see? What do you think about this? Um, 
the other one is uh, it's, it's basically 80% what you're gonna hear from the coach will be questions. So the coach will ask you a lot of questions. There is a certain methodology behind those questions. Like there is a recommended way how you follow that logic of questions and what you should go through, etc. Uh, but also, I think a lot of these questions are situational. So uh, I give you an example. Uh, some guys developed an artificial intelligence algorithm, like a like a, a neural network that is also trying to play the role of a coach. So it asks, it was, it was I think, um, built on thousands of hours of filmed coaching sessions with the top coaches in the world in English. And uh, it learned what kind of questions to ask. And it asks very good questions and it will ask probably better questions that maybe I will ask in general. But this neural network fails when it comes to spotting specific things you know, that, that like some, some frowning on your face, etc. And you can ask a question, okay, you're telling me that, but you know what? I see like you're, you're frowning, you're skeptical, like you are now right, right now, right? So <laughs> I, I noticed that and I just played back to the person. It's like, what's going on here? What are you thinking about? So neural networks cannot do this yet. Yet, maybe in some future, right? So it's a combination of observation and asking question that feeds back to the situation, to what the person says, to, to how he or she behaves, you know, all these things. And then, as I told you, because you work on the situational level and then you go on the psychological level, or I would say emotional level, and sometimes even deeper and fundamental beliefs level, um, you need some techniques to open up the person, the subconscious level of the person. Because a lot of people, like, they, they don't know this. They are not very good at self-analysis. They, they kind of don't understand. For them, this is like a dark room. They don't know what's going on here. And uh, a lot of them actually deliberately put it like a, a big you know, lock on it. And, like, they don't want to go there. <laughs> <laughs> right? So you need some techniques that, uh, I mean, you can use some drawings, some cards, some uh, situational uh, kind of um, techniques in the room. Especially now when, like, we cannot face people... Um, for one-on-one -on -one, face to face sessions you have to use uh, kind of zoom or something else and then you have to go creative how you try to implement similar techniques in um, in, in a digital world mm -hmm. uh, what are generally uh, the problems that your clients come to you with uh, so mostly business problems or family problems I would say 80% are related to work, but this is also because uh, where they see my value. Yeah, because uh, unlike a lot of coaches who are HR people who learned coaching or psychologists or therapists who also learned coaching, uh, I, I, I have experience in HR. I, I did it for five years in my career at the beginning of it, but I also spent 10 years in consulting. So. I know and I have a very good understanding of, of uh, business environment. That's why people trust me that I can understand it. And then I'm also trained in the coach. So I think probably that's why 80-90% of my of the requests from my clients are related to their business. Uh, like their behavior in the company, the relationships with the boss, with the team, you know, whatever. Uh, quite a lot work on, uh, like they ask me to help them make an improvement of some development areas. They had some feedback sessions and like for years, there's a thing they cannot improve. And then they said, okay, I need a coach. I cannot cope with this myself. They watched all the YouTube videos. They kind of read all the books, it doesn't work. So what do I do? Then, then just one hour before our session here, I had a call from a guy I knew and he, he actually said exactly this. He said, look, um, I changed the company, but it looks like uh, my problems just follow me because I don't change myself. It's been two years and I, I just got him, I may, missed a major opportunity at work. So it um, looks like I need a coach. Can you help me? So, um, but if you look at the statistics of International Coaching Federation, the underlying issue in 80% of cases is lack of self-confidence. So people come with an issue, I don't know, my boss is an asshole. How do I deal with him? you end up understanding that it's a self-confidence issue of uh, the person. My statistics, I, I, I had not so many clients, probably around 30, 20, 30, is that, yes, in most cases, you, in this or that way, deal with self-confidence. And it doesn't mm -hmm. matter what level. It's, it's like, can be a beginner level or it can be a board level. 
How exactly does it work in terms of uh, the period of those sessions? How many do you need usually? Is it like uh, this thing with uh, a therapist that you go to once a week for several years, maybe even uh, all your life? Or is it uh, like a one-time thing that you come to a coach, he or she uh, helps you dig inside yourself, you find a solution and you're done. Yeah. You know, when, when I started describing these uh, endless uh, sessions with therapists, I remember a joke about uh, an old guy who's a lawyer uh, dying and then his son comes and he wants to make something some some good news to his father and he says you know father you remember that was uh, one of these legal cases you had there was a divorce between that couple that you couldn't solve in 15 years i just want to tell you i solved it he's like you my son you're an idiot i've been earning money throughout these 15 years on these people and now what are you gonna <laughs> do right um say so I, I i do feel that sometimes yes there are people who kind of uh, they're focusing on the process, not necessarily, which, which gives you a relief. Yeah, because you go to a therapist, you talk, just uh, empty your bag and, you know, you feel better. But you don't solve the problem. There are therapists with whom you need three, four sessions and all is done. Yeah, so I, I don't think that all the therapists is like you, you need the two years of this. Um, with the coaching, I think, in my experience, to address the issues that, that like bother you now, you need between four and six sessions. First sessions are usually one hour and a half. Then it, they could be like, uh, I don't know, uh, 45 minutes. If this is a very specific session, you can find some solutions, some solutions, not address it completely, even in one session, like in 45 minutes. But that's, uh, I do have this sometimes, like when uh, just some of my colleagues ask me to help them and uh, we have like a 45 minutes conversation and they can find some solutions, but to, to really address the problem, you need more. Um, usually it's once in three, four weeks, because I think the major work happens in between the sessions. Yes, like we talk, like, the, like I ask questions, etc. but if you run a good session, you ask the questions that the person keeps on thinking afterwards. And like you go to, like you meet for the next session and then they say, you know what? I had so many good ideas after our session, like this, this, and this, and this, and this. So that's perfect. Mm -hmm. I see. Uh, ju uh, you know me to some extent. What would you say? Do I need a coach? You say everybody needs a coach. Uh, if I need a coach, what for? What could it be? Tell me a problem and I'll tell you if you need a coach. Well, I have many, I wouldn't say they are problems, but they are challenges. Yeah, For challenges, example, I want, to, I want to grow my uh, English language YouTube channel and uh, my blogs uh, internationally. That's a major challenge that I'm now dealing with. Or I want to uh, grow even more in the Russian market where I already have some popularity, but I want to grow my blogs and influence there. That's... Uh, the main challenges that I'm facing right now. Wow. Is it something wow. that the coach could help with or is this for consultants? I think it's both. If you don't know what to do, maybe there is a space for a consultant. But if you know what to do, but you cannot make a choice and you don't do this, mm -hmm. then I think the consultant will not help you. And there's a space for a coach. The better question is why it's the challenge for you. Well, because it's not uh, an easy task, I would say. I, I, I probably know what to do. I, I, have, uh, I have the knowledge and, I, and I'm doing what I, I should do, I think. Maybe not uh, the best way I could, but uh, step by step, uh, I'm making some progress. But with a coach, I could uh, maybe be more effective in that. What, what do you think? Yes. And... Um... Look, if you have a challenge, there are two things. Yeah, there are externalities that like, I don't know, there is a market, there is a, a whatever, coronavirus coming, etc. Some things you cannot influence. Uh, and there are some things that are under your control. This is yourself and your inner circle or closest circle of things that you can influence. And I think uh, quite often you focus too much either on the things you cannot influence, for example, and you put too much energy on this. And uh, like I, I had qu quite a few sessions with the business, like uh, with the entrepreneurs. 
where actually for them that was one of the biggest insights they were getting is that they were focusing their energy on something they cannot influence and therefore it was like you know mm -hmm. throwing a water on a stone like nothing was happening you know and then just realizing that they reorganized the thing they got the list of things they can influence and they focused on them and and, and they succeeded so it it depends i mean I offered you a session, so you're welcome. <laughs> you <can explore. laughs> okay, thanks. I, I'll take the offer. Eugene, uh, could you please tell me some stories uh, of your clients? Uh, because uh, uh, I know you've told me a story about uh, this uh, lady who had psychological issues about uh, her father passing away, uh, but maybe something about business uh, that you helped solve. Within the limits of confidentiality, of course. Yeah. No, it's like, um, uh, for example, I had, a, I had one client who is uh, an entrepreneur. He was trying to raise some money in the US and uh, there was just, uh, he was failing and he couldn't and like he was about to close his business. So he came to me uh, with a problem. Uh, shall I just close my business and go work back to kind of an enterprise to a company? And then um, through the discussion, we kind of managed to understand why this question is out there. And again, that was to do something, something to do with his self-confidence, that because of all these no answers he got from some of the um, uh, potential investors, he, got, he lost the confidence in himself, he lost the energy. And like, uh, it was very difficult for him to focus on preparing a good pitch. And when he was going to the pitch, he was already not as confident as he used to be. And that was like a vicious circle. So when he realized that, there was that helped him actually. And uh, three weeks later, we were supposed to have a session. He said, sorry, I have to cancel it. And then he calls me and says, I just secured 100K. That's gonna be enough for me to run my business for a year. So um, hmm. I, I think, I don't know if that helped, but that was definitely, we, we, we talked a lot about some smaller things as well, but uh, I think that was, Probably he, he realized what was going on and he just focused on that. Yeah, on, on just making sure that his self-confidence is there. Um, there was another client of mine, which we, we actually became good friends and we stopped our client coach relationship, um, who was also quite a senior manager in consulting company. And he really wanted to become a partner. And he, he like, um, I don't know, he, was working days and nights just to achieve this next promotion, etc. And then I could see that he was actually super tired. And uh, he even told me in the sessions, I'm tired, but like, no, I have to run forward, etc. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And then we found the ways how he could be more productive, how he could kind of shine in front of the partners, like how he could um, improve uh, the delivery and the results. And he did that. The thing is, he went on vacation for three weeks in Hawaii. And uh, he came back and said, like, I don't want to do this anymore. I realized that I'm so tired, <laughs> I have a burnout, uh, just stopping. So he stopped. He's now looking for another job. Well, the market is not so good now, but um, I think this is also a good result because he realized what he really wanted and what he thought he wanted was actually not the thing that he really wanted. Do you think that coaches uh, help uh people and the world as a whole uh, more than management consultants. Because, you know, there are lots of stereotypes about management consulting, about how big firms pay uh, BCG, McKinsey, Bain or other companies uh, huge amounts of money in order to develop some strategies that uh, uh, then uh, go nowhere and uh, uh, that uh, just our uh, money spenders. So uh, how would you compare these two industries, being a part of both of them? Well, the way the things are today, I think they, they are very separated and they don't cross much. Although actually I do use sometimes in my consulting, like in my work, uh, I do use coaching techniques. Just um, uh, last, September, I think, or August, I had uh, an NGO. We were doing some pro bono work for them. And they came to me uh, asking if BCG could help do this pro bono work. I said, yes, of course, but what's, let's talk about your problem. And they told me the problem. And I used coaching techniques on them, even some 
instruments to get them to the subconscious level to understand what's what's going on there. And there was a super productive session. So I think that there is a space for coaching techniques in management mm -hmm. consulting. Yeah, in the way you treat clients, in the way you treat uh, your team. I started using it a lot in uh, helping my team grow and develop. It's probably taking a bit more time. I mean, whenever I have a choice to give just a blunt feedback to the person or sugar-coated feedback, like, and that's gonna take me 10, 15 minutes, or I can use a coaching conversation over a glass of beer that's gonna take an hour. And I think that extra 45 minutes of my time investment pays back with a multiple hours of more effective work of this or that uh, employee. Um, I, when you asked the question, I could hear a little bit of skepticism saying, yeah, you know, like these big management consulting companies, they're paid money and like, you know, they create something useless. Um, you know, I think this is exactly a childish behavior on, behind of the client, on, the, on the side of the clients because a lot of them who don't know how to work with consultants, they think, okay, there's a magic something. The consultants will come and do everything for me. This is like a child sitting there and saying, okay, my daddy gonna buy me everything, you know, like I don't need to do anything. <laughs> Uh, and some clients in coaching are, are like this. They expect the coach to come and do all the work for you. No. The coach is there to help you. And the same is with the consultant. The consultant is there to help you to find the right answer. But you have to take the ownership, the decision, and go and do the stuff. If you say, hey, consultants created a strategy that doesn't work, well, have you tried to implement it? Yes? Or kind of, were you part of the process when the strategy was created? You had a chance to say no, to disagree, but if you said yes, go and do this, you take responsibility. So I, I find this very mature if someone says, I paid you the money, I wanted like everything to be perfect. No, you pay the money for people to help you and then you still are in the driver's seat. And it doesn't matter whether it's coaching or consulting. Uh, you know that uh, many uh, companies nowadays, even uh, hugely successful ones like uh, Apple or other top uh, Silicon Valley IT giants don't use management consulting companies or use them really rarely, uh, but use their in-house competencies. Uh, don't you think that this trend will continue and uh, that the management consulting firms will uh, lose a huge share of the market because of that? Because uh, more and more in-house experts are better at uh, producing a similar kind of work for their own enterprise uh, if you compare them with uh, management consultants? Look, um, there are very few companies who do this. You mentioned Apple, I can mention Procter & Gamble, for example. And I'm not talking now as, as, a, as a BCG employee, it's just my observation. When things go well for you, as a company, when you kind of just grow your market share, you like kind of, you know, growing like crazy, just because you made some smart moves or you were lucky, uh, you don't need management consultants. You can, I mean, you have enough margins and you have enough space to make all kinds of mistakes yourself, right? But when I look at, at for example, luxury business, they, these companies, and they worked in such a company like 10 years ago, they have huge margins. They can afford to be ineffective. They're hugely ineffective in many mm -hmm. respects. But because they have so much money, they don't care. The cost of a wrong decision could be 1%, 2% of EBITDA. For a fast-moving consumer goods or for a retailer, that's live or die. For them, <laughs> okay, right? But now things are changing. For example, you look at the luxury business today in the coronavirus situation. And the Hong Kong protests in, 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 in there caused a lot of disruption for that market. The second-hand market for watches, for example. There are a lot of challenges and disruptions now. And they understand, oh, wow, the digital stuff. Like, are digital watches a, 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 a competitor to, to your kind of super expensive luxury watches? No, you know, you, you don't understand. You don't know what to do with this. And, like, you, you, you do ask for help. And you ask, so no, like these companies usually don't develop their own cons uh, kind of consulting units first. They first kind of start working with external consultancies. And then at some point, if they need, if they understand that, okay, we have a constant need of um, reinventing ourselves, of addressing problems, etc., they create these consulting, in-house consulting units. Like right now I'm running a, a project for one of the clients where we 
help them build not just the strategy, but also the strategy function inside them. Yeah, so they realize they need it on a constant basis. And I think that creates more market for consulting companies because uh, once you understand that you constantly need new strategy, the changes, new optimizations, um, even if you buy the best team from McKinsey or from BCG or from Bain, they're only good for the next probably year and a half in terms of their knowledge of what's going on. Yes, they have expertise how to run things, they understand the industry, but they don't know how the others are doing this. They, don't, they lose the, the touch with the latest and greatest. So it's not, it's not about that the one individual person is so smart and he knows all. No, it's, it's about how the company is built because there is a wealth of knowledge. There are databases that are constantly updated. They are like experts that come and go, etc. So there's this collective wisdom and the scale is super important because, uh, I mean, just all the weekend, I've been reading emails with a request from Asia. Hey, we are doing like this uh, po post-COVID strategy for this company. Uh, do you have any idea, guys, what others are doing, right? And there are like 25 emails from all over the world within like two hours saying we're doing this, 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 and this. So if you're inside the company, it will take you ages to collect the same amount of information. So you will need consulting services. I don't think that it's gonna die, no. Uh, how do you think uh, this industry will change over the coming years and decades? That's a very good question. If I knew the answer, I would probably just come to the CEO of McKinsey and BCG and say, hey, that's what you have to do, pay me a lot of money, right? <laughs> I don't know. And uh, when we come to the, uh, these big internal meetings uh, and these things being discussed, there are lots of scenarios. We always look at what's going on and try to kind of, you know, keep, uh, keep the pulse, yeah, our, our arm on the pulse, what's, what's happening. Um, I see a couple of uh, longer term trends that started like many years back. And I think they're going to continue. So one of the trends is big data. So the way it's changing uh, the consulting uh, trade, let's put it this way. 20 years ago, the whole project of three months could be just collect the data and put it in a couple of nice tables and graphs. That's it. Just creating transparency. Because it was scattered, it was difficult to collect, it was not digitized, it was sitting like, you know, in heads of people. And I think that was very close to what my first project looks like. We spent, I think, a few couple of projects, especially the, the ones that were related to the market, not to the benchmarking, not to the internal efficiency of the company, um, just, just collecting the data, like a month and a half, two months. Then I think now, somewhere like around 2013, I could already see that this data collection phase shrank from two months to probably two, three weeks. So the rest, you do the analysis and you do the implementation. Now, more and more often, we already start with the project when the data is there. So we don't start the project before the data is collected. We just tell our clients, this is the kind of data we need, go collect it, whatever you have. We assess it, we say, okay, we probably need one more week just to close the gaps or we close these gaps along the way but you start the project after this. So whatever was the project before is a prerequisite for a project today. And I think that's gonna continue. Mm -hmm. Now, the other thing is that uh, with the big data, you have other challenges. You have too much data, too much noise. You have to clean. So we have more and more projects where like we work on this big data and like artificial intelligence algorithms that we try to implement. But actually we realize through some painful experiences that where we didn't understand this in the beginning, that you need to spend probably two, three, four weeks and allocate a lot of resources to clean the data because garbage in, garbage out. So now there's a different challenge. There is too much data and you have to allocate resources to clean it. Um, and I think that this is gonna continue. Yeah, so the companies will develop tools, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, but this data challenge will be still kind of evolving and you know it says. But I think today there's an understanding that in any transformation, Data is just, uh, well, algorithms are 10%, data is 20%, but the change management, meaning influencing people, uh, how they should work, how to convince uh, the ones who disagree, etc., 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 this is 70% of the effort. And I think that before that, 70% was the data. Now it's just 20% and algorithms, yeah? So uh, 
that changes the requirements to people. And I think that in managing consulting, I don't think yet that has changed because there is a need for management consultants to become more like psychologists, like coaches a little bit, to understand the human side of things. And I don't think that the overall the industry has responded yet to this need. There are some yeah, because they select people based on how good they can do maths and stuff like that. Not solve not, cases. Not, not, not only. Not, not only, only or but uh, but signif insignificant part due to no, I think, that I, skill I, set. I think this right? is slightly different. There are three buckets of criteria when you go to consulting that are being assessed. First, this is your overall fit. It's basically uh, uh, like how good you are, your leadership skills, blah blah blah. You know, like what's what's mm -hmm. your education, what's your achievements. This is like your CV, what you've done in the past. Are you one of the best in what you're doing, right? But then once you go to the interviews, there are two more things that I assessed. One of them is uh, exactly how you solve the problem, the case. So your structured thinking, your business judgment, your kind of calculations, uh, your creativity, all these things, yeah? your, your synthesis. But we also assess um, your presence, how you communicate, how you can maintain the contact with the person. You know, how can you build a relationship? Are you a nice person to be around? Basically answering the question, will I be comfortable to send this person tomorrow to my client alone? You know, um, and, and all these three things, your, your fundamental fit, your, uh, your, how you crack the case and your presence and your ability to communicate properly, they all have the equal weight. So they do assess you on, on how you kind of talk to people, etc. What I'm talking is slightly different. This is, you will never be able to assess the change management skills and convincing people, you know, in, in an interview. That's something different. You require a lot of training. And I've been to some of these trainings and they, they aim at this. They kind of teach us to listen more, to understand the concerns, etc. But it's, um, when I compare it to coaching and what coaching can do, I think there is a long way that consulting industry has to go to be able to really impact this. What happens today is that consultants design this kind of together with the headquarters and like and they engage some organization parts, they design these changing programs. And then the change comes. And you know, either you're in front of the train or and it runs over you or you're on the train. And some people, they just don't know what to do. They are shocked because you know, the train is coming. What do they do? Do I jump or do I stand here? They freeze because they're shocked. It's stress. Um, and then the companies, uh, hire some psychologists, some therapists, some coaches to help them deal with that change, you know? Uh, and I think that uh, consultants could play a bit more of a role here as well. I see. Uh, I would really wanted to discuss with you uh, a topic that is, uh, well, uh, the most uh, popular topic of discussion among some of my friends right now, uh, the coronavirus and how yeah. it is changing the business and the career market. I know that you are also a career coach. So could you please share some advice to uh, yuppies, <laughs> young uh, people uh, making uh, forward with their careers or their businesses? some advice on how to win in the current uh, situation in the pandemic. Look, this is probably, I don't know, since the 90s, this is not the first crisis I'm observing. Uh, I was at school when the Soviet Union collapsed and there was probably the deepest crisis I've witnessed. Uh, there were some crises like in the 98, and then 2008, then 2019, 20, you know, so every 10 years, there is a major economic disruption. And I think the rules are the same, what happens. Um, first, you need to understand that this is not for a month or two. You need to accept that this situation is for a couple of months, at least. So now there's a lot of discussion, whether it's a V-shape, so basically there's a sharp drop, but there's a very quick recovery, where there is a U-shape, when it's like kind of drop, some kind of time we spend at the bottom, then we recover. Or where this L shape, where basically we drop and we stay at the lower level, you know? And I think now the consensus is it's gonna be a longer U shape kind of thing. So how long it will be, nobody knows, but between six and nine months for sure, before we will see the upper trajectory. Just have to accept this. If you, uh, 
why acceptance is important because you stop stressing about this you understand this is the new normal stop stressing this this forget about the all the contracts you had before all the business that opportunities that you had before this is the new normal like it's now reset now stop crying stop panicking stop you no know, sobbing about the past look around you there are lots of opportunities right they may be different from what you have to do you may have to change your business model you may have to change your business i don't know if it's dead but uh, you have to do something. And the first thing is to understand that things are not as they used to be. And they will not be exactly as they used to be even when it, all of it is over. Um, second thing is, um, uh, look, you need to understand what's happening and what's triggering. It's, it's a domino effect, which has implications both on business and on employment. So when companies like, uh, let's take airlines, they stop kind of running flights they had to pay some compensations for the tickets, etc. So they live not on a very high margin. So to avoid all the losses, they kind of, what do they do? They start cutting some things which were not essential to running the business. I mean, training companies, coaches, consultants, <laughs> you know, things. Well, with consultants, sometimes they come back because they understand they need consultants to um, kind of to understand what to do <laughs> now, right? But a lot of these extra services they just stopped and uh, they put on hold some even big transformation projects like with IT implementation sometimes, etc. because they say, okay, we need, to, we need to understand how it's gonna influence what's gonna be in the future. Let's take a break. Um, they start laying off people. They start probably, well, some, in some countries and some companies, there are strong trade unions that don't allow for this, etc. So they take loans, they take government bailouts, whatever, but they try to protect the core, but they lay off people, either those who wanted to, they wanted to fire anyway, or the ones that are not critical to business, like temp, temp workers, like etc. cetera. So I think that the gig economy, uh, those who are working like for big kind of corporations, they suffer short-term shock because they will be the easiest to cut and stop and like do some savings. Now, this shock will not be forever because like some budgets will get unfrozen later on and they will need some help slowly here and there. So I think what you can do is what the big consulting companies do. They invest into relationship because the most important thing if you're kind of about to lose your client, if it's all about the money, forget about the money, invest into relationship. Do some free stuff, give a discount, say, okay, you pay me later. But if it's an important client who's been with you for a long time, just uh, make sure you are around. They will really appreciate it when it's all over. Um, in, in consulting, that's what we've done a couple of times in the previous crisis as well. With the biggest clients, we said, okay, we understand this is a big problem. We invest, we put a small team that's gonna be with you like on your most critical decisions and we do it for free. And then it pays back afterwards because people remember how you help them in difficult times. Yeah, so um, that's, that's one thing. The other thing is, um, I think just if you lost a job, okay, for three, six months, that's gonna be a problem. Probably you won't be able to find something very quickly. But you need to understand that this is, um, who's lost the job? In most cases, 80% of the market uh, of people on unemployed, these are the ones who would have lost their job sooner or later anyway. I'm not speaking about some industries like restaurants or, you know, um, or something like this. There you lost the job because like there is no business, but very quickly it's gonna come back. I mean, like in Switzerland, for example, they're announcing, they announced uh, yesterday that they're gonna reopen the economy slowly. So the hairdressers will start working again in, uh, in a week from now, etc. So yes, you might have lost your job, but you will very quickly just get it back, you know? Um, it's more difficult if you kind of a guy like me, or I don't know, if, if you're a manager in marketing or something else in, in Procter & Gamble or whatever, because yes, that's a bit more difficult. Now, what can you do? How can you spend these six months? You just need to be better than the 20% of people in the market. So imp improve your skills and not focus only on the skills that you were told you're not good at. I don't know, if you're not good at communication skills, bring it to the average level. Don't overinvest into bringing it into the top level. You will not become the top communicator if you are kind of below average today. But with some modest effect, you can get to the average level. Then also learn new skills. 
not just everything that interests you, but look at where you want to be, where your career aspiration is. Look at the people who are already there, what skills they have. Look at yourself. Where is the gap? Try to close this gap. And also focus on something that you're strong, because that's very easy with a little bit of effort to become even stronger. Get a role model, someone who is like in the same dimension, but two, three levels higher than you and very strong. Talk to these people, try to copy, understand what they do and just grow to their level. Because then I think eventually these are the things that you're being hired on or promoted on. Yeah, it's like, what are your spikes? What are your strengths? I think that, sorry, wow. it, it, was, it was a lot uh, in, in a long answer to your short question, but uh, <laughs> you asked it. <laughs> Well, uh, you are a consultant, so that <laughs> that was expected that you can structure your long answers uh, in a me-see kind of way, like mutually exclusive, collectively exhaustive, all those kind of things that they teach you. Well, Eugene, I think this has been a fascinating talk. Uh, unfortunately, we're running out of time, but I I want to say I, I want to thank you for uh, for your advice I, I i i'm sure it will be um helpful for many of our viewers and listeners uh, and i'm also really interested in uh, trying out uh, your uh, coaching session looking up to it maybe i'll tell my subscribers later how how it went uh, if you like this uh, uh, podcast, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, Must Reader. Or if you like listening to content instead of uh, watching it, subscribe uh, to my podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Deezer, and other podcasting platforms. All the links are in the description of this video. Uh, if you like the video, hit the like button, ding the uh, subscribe button and the bell button, and uh, also write a comment about it to help uh, me with the YouTube algorithms that I'm struggling to overcome right now. <laughs> Yep. Eugen, thanks, thanks so much. Uh, I hope I'll see you again uh, pretty soon. Yep. Talk to you soon. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Ciao.